Archetypes of the Collective Unconscious The hypothesis of a collective unconscious belongs to the class of ideas that people at first find strange, but soon come to possess and use as familiar conceptions. This has been the case with the concept of the unconscious in general. After the philosophical idea of the unconscious, in the form presented chiefly by Carus and von Hartmann, had gone down under the overwhelming wave of materialism and empiricism, leaving hardly a ripple behind it, it gradually reappeared in the scientific domain of medical psychology. At first, the concept of the unconscious was limited to denoting the state of repressed or forgotten contents. Even with fraud, who makes the unconscious, at least metaphorically, take the stage as the acting subject, it is really nothing but the gathering place of forgotten and repressed contents, and has a functional significance thanks only to these. For Freud, accordingly, the unconscious is of an exclusively personal nature, although he was aware of its archaic and mythological thought forms. A more or less superficial layer of the unconscious is undoubtedly personal. I call it the personal unconscious. But this personal unconscious rests upon a deeper layer, which does not derive from personal experience, and is not a personal acquisition, but is inborn. This deeper layer I call the collective unconscious. I have chosen the term collective because this part of the unconscious is not individual, but universal. In contrast to the personal psyche, it has contents and modes of behavior that are more or less the same everywhere and in all individuals. It is, in other words, identical in all men and thus constitutes a common psychic substrate of a superpersonal nature which is present in every one of us. It is, in other words, identical in all men and thus constitutes a common psychic substrate of a suprapersonal nature which is present in every one of us. Psychic existence can be recognized only by the presence of contents that are capable of consciousness. We can therefore speak of an unconscious only in so far as we are able to demonstrate its contents. The contents of the personal unconscious are chiefly the feeling-toned complexes, as they are called. They constitute the personal and private side of psychic life. The contents of the collective unconscious, on the other hand, are known as archetypes. The term archetype occurs as early as Philo Judaeus with reference to the Imago Dei, God image in man. It can also be found in Irenaeus who says, The creator of the world did not fashion these things directly from himself, but copied them from archetypes outside himself. In the Corpus Hermeticum, God is called archetypal light. The term occurs several times in Dionysius, the Areopagite, as for instance in the Celesti Hierarchia, as immaterial archetypes, and in the Divinis Nominibus, as archetypal stone. The term archetype is not found in St. Augustine, but the idea of it is. Thus, in the Diversis Questionibus, he speaks of idea principales, which are themselves not formed, but are contained in the divine understanding. Archetype is an explanatory paraphrase of the Platonic Eidos. For our purpose, this term is apposite and helpful, because it tells us that so far, as the collective unconscious contents are concerned, we are dealing with archaic, or, I would say, primordial types. That is, with universal images that have existed since the remotest times. The term representations collectives, used by Levi Brühl to denote the symbolic figures in the primitive view of the world, could easily be applied to unconscious contents as well, since it means practically the same thing. Primitive tribal law is concerned with archetypes that have been modified in a special way. They are no longer contents of the unconscious, but have already been changed into conscious formulae taught according to tradition, generally in the form of esoteric teaching. This last is a typical means of expression for the transmission of collective contents, 
originally derived from the unconscious. Another well-known expression of the archetypes is myth and fairy tale. But here too we are dealing with forms that have received a specific stamp and have been handed down through long periods of time. The term archetype thus applies only indirectly to the representations collectives, since it designates only those psychic contents which have not yet been submitted to conscious elaboration and are therefore an immediate datum of psychic experience. In this sense, there is a considerable difference between the archetype and the historical formula that has evolved. Especially on the higher levels of esoteric teaching, the archetypes appear in a form that reveals quite unmistakably the critical and evaluating influence of conscious elaboration. Their immediate manifestation, as we encounter it in dreams and visions, is much more individual, less understandable, and more naive than in myths, for example. The archetype is essentially an unconscious content that is altered by becoming conscious and by being perceived, and it takes its color from the individual consciousness in which it happens to appear. Footnote. One must, for the sake of accuracy, distinguish between archetype and archetypal ideas. The archetype as such is a hypothetical and irrepresentable model, something like the pattern of behavior in biology. Compare On the Nature of the Psyche, section 7. What the word archetype means in the nominal sense is clear enough, then, from its relations with myth, esoteric teaching and fairy tale. But if we try to establish what an archetype is psychologically, the matter becomes more complicated. So far, mythologists have always helped themselves out with solar, lunar, meteorological, vegetal, and other ideas of the kind. The fact that myths are first and foremost psychic phenomena that reveal the nature of the soul is something they have absolutely refused to see until now. Primitive man is not much interested in objective explanations of the obvious, but he has an imperative need, or rather, his unconscious psyche has an irresistible urge to assimilate all outer sense experiences to inner psychic events. It is not enough for the primitive to see the sun rise and set. This external observation must at the same time be a psychic happening. The sun in its course must represent the fate of a god or hero who, in the last analysis, dwells nowhere except in the soul of man. All the mythologized processes of nature, such as summer and winter, the phases of the moon, the rainy seasons and so forth, are in no sense allegories of these objective occurrences. Rather, they are symbolic expressions of the inner, unconscious drama of the psyche, which becomes accessible to man's consciousness by way of projection, that is, mirrored in the events of nature. The projection is so fundamental that it has taken several thousand years of civilization to detach it in some measure from its outer object. In the case of astrology, for instance, this age-old scientia intuitiva came to be branded as rank heresy because man had not yet succeeded in making the psychological description of character independent of the stars. Even today, people who still believe in astrology fall almost without exception for the old superstitious assumption of the influence of the stars. And yet anyone who can calculate a horoscope should know that since the days of Hippocus of Alexandria, the spring point has been fixed at zero degrees Aries, and that the zodiac on which every horoscope is based is therefore quite arbitrary, the spring point having gradually advanced since then into the first degrees of Pisces owing to the precession of the equinoxes. Primitive man impresses us so strongly with his subjectivity that we should really have guessed long ago that myths refer to something psychic. His knowledge of nature is essentially the language and outer dress of an unconscious psychic process. But the very fact that this process is unconscious gives us the reason why man has thought of everything except the psyche in his attempts to explain myths. He simply didn't know that the psyche contains all the images that have ever given rise to myths, 
and that our unconscious is an acting and suffering subject with an inner drama which primitive man rediscovers by means of analogy and the processes of nature both great and small. Footnote. See further my papers on the Divine Child and the Cori in the present volume, and Karini's complementary essays in Essays on or Introduction to a Science of Mythology. Why is psychology the youngest of the empirical sciences? Why have we not long since discovered the unconscious and raised up its treasure house of eternal images? Simply because we had a religious formula for everything psychic, and one that is far more beautiful and comprehensive than immediate experience. Though the Christian view of the world has paled for many people, the symbolic treasure rooms of the East are still full of marvels and can nourish for a long time to come the passion for show and new clothes. What is more, these images, be they Christian or Buddhist or what you will, are lovely, mysterious, richly intuitive. Naturally, the more familiar we are with them, the more does constant usage polish them smooth, so that what remains is only banal superficiality and meaningless paradox. The mystery of the virgin birth, or the homoousia of the son with the father, or the trinity which is nevertheless not a triad, these no longer lend wings to any philosophical fancy. They have stiffened into mere objects of belief. So it is not surprising if the religious need, the believing mind and the philosophical speculations of the educated European are attracted by the symbols of the East. Those grandiose conceptions of divinity in India and the abysms of Taoist philosophy in China, just as once before the heart and mind of the men of antiquity were gripped by Christian ideas. There are many Europeans who began by surrendering completely to the influence of the Christian symbol until they landed themselves in a Kierkegaardian neurosis or whose relation to God, owing to the progressive impoverishment of symbolism, developed into an unbearably sophisticated I-U relationship only to fall victims in their turn to the magic and novelty of Eastern symbols. This surrender is not necessarily a defeat, rather it proves the receptiveness and vitality of the religious sense. We can observe much the same thing in the educated Oriental, who not infrequently feels drawn to the Christian symbol or to the science that is so unsuited to the Oriental mind and even develops an enviable understanding of them. That people should succumb to these eternal images is entirely normal. In fact, it is what these images are for. They are meant to attract, to convince, to fascinate, and to overpower. They are created out of the primal stuff of revelation and reflect the ever-unique experience of divinity. That is why they always give man a premonition of the divine, while at the same time safeguarding him from immediate experience of it. Thanks to the labors of the human spirit over the centuries, these images have become embedded in a comprehensive system of thought that describes an order of the world and are at the same time represented by a mighty, far-spread and venerable institution called the Church. I can best illustrate my meaning by taking as an example the Swiss mystic and hermit, Brother Nicholas of Flew, who has recently been canonized. Probably his most important religious experience was the so-called Trinity Vision, which preoccupied him to such an extent that he painted it, or had it painted, on the wall of his cell. The painting is still preserved in the parish church at Sachsen. It is a mandala divided into six parts, and in the center is the crowned countenance of God. This is what I call the elaboration of the symbol. His reflections on the nature of the vision, influenced as they were by the mystic diagrams he used as a guiding thread, inevitably led him to the conclusion that he must have gazed upon the Holy Trinity itself, the Summum Bonum, eternal love. This is borne out by the expurgated version now in Zaxan. The original experience, however, was entirely different. 
In his ecstasy, there was revealed to Brother Klaus a sight so terrible that his own countenance was changed by it. So much so, indeed, that people were terrified and felt afraid of him. What he had seen was a vision of the utmost intensity. Wölflin, our oldest source, writes as follows. All who came to him were filled with terror at the first glance. As to the cause of this, he himself used to say that he had seen a piercing light resembling a human face. At the sight of it, he feared that his heart would burst into little pieces. Therefore, overcome with terror, he instantly turned his face away and fell to the ground. And that was the reason why his face was now terrible to others. Footnote. Heinrich Wölflin, also called by the Latin form Lupulus, born 1470, humanist and director of Latin studies at Bern, cited in Fritz Blanke, Bruder Klaus von Flühe. This vision has rightly been compared with the one in Revelation, that strange apocalyptic Christ image which, for sheer gruesomeness and singularity, is surpassed only by the monstrous seven-eyed lamb with seven horns. It is certainly very difficult to see what is the relationship between this figure and the Christ of the Gospels. Hence, Brother Klaus's vision was interpreted in a quite definite way by the earliest sources. In 1508, the humanist Karl Bovillus wrote to a friend, I wish to tell you of a vision which appeared to him in the sky on a night when the stars were shining and he stood in prayer and contemplation. He saw the head of a human figure with a terrifying face full of wrath and threats. This interpretation agrees perfectly with the modern amplification furnished by Revelation chapter 1 to 13. Nor should we forget Brother Claus's other visions, for instance, of Christ in the bear skin, of God the Father and God the Mother, and of himself as the Son. They exhibit features which are very undogmatic indeed. Traditionally, this great vision was brought into connection with the Trinity picture in the church at Zaxeln, and so, likewise, was the wheel symbolism in the so-called Pilgrim's Tract. Brother Claus, we are told, showed the picture of the wheel to a visiting pilgrim. Evidently, this picture had preoccupied him for some time. Blanca is of the opinion that, contrary to tradition, there is no connection between the vision and the Trinity picture. This skepticism seems to me to go too far. There must have been some reason for Brother Claus's interest in the wheel. Visions like the one he had often cause mental confusion and disintegration, witness the heart bursting into little pieces. We know from experience that the protective circle, the mandala, is the traditional antidote for chaotic states of mind. It is therefore only too clear why Brother Claus was fascinated by the symbol of the wheel. The interpretation of the terrifying vision as an experience of God need not be so wide of the mark either. The connection between the great vision and the Trinity picture, and of both with the wheel symbol, therefore seems to me very probable on psychological grounds. This vision, undoubtedly fearful and highly perturbing, which burst like a volcano upon his religious view of the world, without any dogmatic prelude, and without exegetical commentary, naturally needed a long labor of assimilation in order to fit it into the total structure of the psyche and thus restore the disturbed psychic balance. Brother Klaus came to terms with his experience on the basis of dogma, then firm as a rock, and the dogma proved its powers of assimilation by turning something horribly alive into the beautiful abstraction of the Trinity idea but the reconciliation might have taken place on a quite different basis provided by the vision itself and its unearthly actuality, much to the disadvantage of the Christian conception of God and no doubt to the still greater disadvantage of Brother Klaus himself, who would then have become not a saint but a heretic, if not a lunatic, 
and would probably have ended his life at the stake. This example demonstrates the use of the dogmatic symbol. It formulates a tremendous and dangerously decisive psychic experience, fittingly called an experience of the divine, in a way that is tolerable to our human understanding, without either limiting the scope of the experience or doing damage to its overwhelming significance. The vision of divine wrath, which we also meet in Jacob Böhme, ill accords with the God of the New Testament, the loving Father in heaven, and for this reason it might easily have become the source of an inner conflict. That would have been quite in keeping with the spirit of the age, the end of the 15th century, the time of Nicolaus Cusanus, whose formula of the Complexio Oppositorum actually anticipated the schism that was imminent. Not long afterwards, the Yahwistic conception of God went through a series of rebirths in Protestantism. Yahweh is a God concept that contains the opposites in a still undivided state. Brother Klaus put himself outside the beaten track of convention and habit by leaving his home and family, living alone for years and gazing deep into the dark mirror, so that the wondrous and terrible boon of original experience befell him. In this situation, the dogmatic image of divinity that had been developed over the centuries worked like a healing draught. It helped him to assimilate the fatal incursion of an archetypal image and so escape being torn asunder. Angelus Silesius was not so fortunate. The inner conflict tore him to pieces because in his day the stability of the church that dogma guarantees was already shattered. Jacob Böhme, too, knew a god of the wrath fire, a real deus absconditus. He was able to bridge the profound and agonizing contradiction on the one hand by means of the Christian formula of father and son and embody it speculatively in his view of the world, which, though Gnostic, was in all essential points Christian. Otherwise he would have become a dualist. On the other hand, it was undoubtedly alchemy, long brewing the union of opposites in secret, that came to his aid. Nevertheless, the opposition has left obvious traces in the mandala appended to his Questions Concerning the Soul, showing the nature of the divinity. The mandala is divided into a dark and a light half, and the semicircles that are drawn round them, instead of joining up to form a ring, are turned back to back. Dogma takes the place of the collective unconscious by formulating its contents on a grand scale. The Catholic way of life is completely unaware of psychological problems in this sense. Almost the entire life of the collective unconscious has been channeled into the dogmatic archetypal ideas and flows along like a well-controlled stream in the symbolism of creed and ritual. It manifests itself in the inwardness of the Catholic psyche. The collective unconscious, as we understand it today, was never a matter of psychology, for before the Christian church existed, there were the antique mysteries, and these reach back into the grey mists of Neolithic prehistory. Mankind has never lacked powerful images to land magical aid against all the uncanny things that live in the depths of the psyche. Always the figures of the unconscious were expressed in protecting and healing images and in this way were expelled from the psyche into cosmic space. The iconoclasm of the Reformation, however, quite literally made a breach in the protective wall of sacred images and since then one image after another has crumbled away. They became dubious, for they conflicted with awakening reason. Besides, people had long since forgotten what they meant. Or had they really forgotten? Could it be that men had never really known what they meant, and that only in recent times did it occur to the Protestant part of mankind that actually we haven't the remotest conception of what is meant by the virgin birth, the divinity of Christ, and the complexities of the Trinity? It almost seems as if these images had just lived, and as if their living existence had simply been accepted without question, 
and without reflection, much as everyone decorates Christmas trees or hides Easter eggs without ever knowing what these customs mean. The fact is that archetypal images are so packed with meaning in themselves that people never think of asking what they really do mean. That the gods die from time to time is due to man's sudden discovery that they do not mean anything. That they are made by human hands, useless idols of wood and stone. In reality, however, he has merely discovered that up till then he has never thought about his images at all. And when he starts thinking about them, he does so with the help of what he calls reason which, in point of fact, is nothing more than the sum total of all his prejudices and myopic views. The history of Protestantism has been one of chronic iconoclasm. One wall after another fell, and the work of destruction was not too difficult once the authority of the church had been shattered. We all know how, in large things as in small, in general as well as in particular, piece after piece collapsed, and how the alarming poverty of symbols that is now the condition of our life came about. With that, the power of the church has vanished too, a fortress robbed of its bastions and casemates, a house whose walls have been plucked away, exposed to all the winds of the world and to all dangers. Although this is, properly speaking, a lamentable collapse that offends our sense of history, the disintegration of Protestantism into nearly 400 denominations is yet a sure sign that the restlessness continues. The Protestant is cast out into a state of defenselessness that might well make the natural man shudder. His enlightened consciousness, of course, refuses to take cognizance of this fact and is quietly looking elsewhere for what has been lost to Europe. We seek the effective images, the thought forms that satisfy the restlessness of heart and mind, and we find the treasures of the East. There is no objection to this in and for itself. Nobody forced the Romans to import Asiatic cults in bulk. If Christianity had really been, as so often described, alien to the Germanic tribes, they could easily have rejected it when the prestige of the Roman legions began to wane. But Christianity had come to stay because it fits in with the existing archetypal pattern. In the course of the centuries, however, it turned into something its founder might well have wondered at had he lived to see it. And the Christianity of Negroes and other dark-skinned converts is certainly an occasion for historical reflections. Why then should the West not assimilate Eastern forms? The Romans too went to Eleusis, Samothrace, and Egypt in order to get themselves initiated. In Egypt there even seems to have been a regular tourist trade in this commodity. The gods of Greece and Rome perished from the same disease as did our Christian symbols. People discovered then, as today, that they had no thoughts whatever on the subject. On the other hand, the gods of the strangers still had unexhausted mana. Their names were weird and incomprehensible, and their deeds portentously dark, something altogether different from the hackneyed chronique scandaleuse of Olympus. At least one couldn't understand the Asiatic symbols, and for this reason they were not banal like the conventional gods. The fact that people accepted the new as unthinkingly as they had rejected the old did not become a problem at that time. Is it becoming a problem today? Shall we be able to put on, like a new suit of clothes, ready-made symbols grown on foreign soil, saturated with foreign blood, spoken in a foreign tongue, nourished by foreign culture, interwoven with foreign history, and so resemble a beggar who wraps himself in kingly raiment, a king who disguises himself as a beggar? No doubt this is possible. Or is there something in ourselves that commands us to go in for no mummeries, but perhaps even to sew our garment ourselves? I am convinced that the growing impoverishment of symbols has a meaning. It is a development that has an inner consistency. Everything that we have not thought about, that has therefore been deprived of a meaningful connection with our developing consciousness, has got lost. 
If we now try to cover our nakedness with the gorgeous trappings of the East, as the theosophists do, we would be playing our own history false. A man does not sink down to beggary only to pose afterwards as an Indian potentate. It seems to me that it would be far better stoutly to avow our spiritual poverty, our symbollessness, instead of feigning a legacy to which we are not the legitimate heirs at all. We are surely the rightful heirs of Christian symbolism, but somehow we have squandered this heritage. We have let the house our fathers built fall into decay, and now we try to break into oriental palaces that our fathers never knew. Anyone who has lost the historical symbols and cannot be satisfied with substitutes is certainly in a very difficult position today. Before him there yawns the void and he turns away from it in horror. What is worse, the vacuum gets filled with absurd political and social ideas, which one and all are distinguished by their spiritual bleakness. But if he cannot get along with these pedantic dogmatisms, he sees himself forced to be serious for once with his alleged trust in God, though it usually turns out that his fear of things going wrong if he did so is even more persuasive. This fear is far from unjustified, for where God is closest, the danger seems greatest. It is dangerous to avow spiritual poverty, for the poor man has desires, and whoever has desires calls down some fatality on himself. A Swiss proverb puts it drastically. Behind every rich man stands a devil, and behind every poor man too. Just as in Christianity the vow of worldly poverty turned the mind away from the riches of this earth, so spiritual poverty seeks to renounce the false riches of the spirit in order to withdraw not only from the sorry remnants which today call themselves the Protestant Church of a great past, but also from all the allurements of the odorous East, in order, finally, to dwell with itself alone, where, in the cold light of consciousness, the blank barrenness of the world reaches to the very stars. We have inherited this poverty from our fathers. I well remember the confirmation lessons I received at the hands of my own father. The catechism bored me unspeakably. One day I was turning over the pages of my little book in the hope of finding something interesting when my eye fell on the paragraphs about the Trinity. This interested me at once, and I waited impatiently for the lessons to get to that section. But when the longed-for lesson arrived, my father said, We'll skip this bit, I can't make head or tail of it myself. With that, my last hope was laid in the grave. I admired my father's honesty, but this did not alter the fact that from then on all talk of religion bored me to death. Our intellect has achieved the most tremendous things, but in the meantime our spiritual dwelling has fallen into disrepair. We are absolutely convinced that even with the aid of the latest and largest reflecting telescope now being built in America, men will discover behind the farthest nebulae no fiery empyrean, and we know that our eyes will wander despairingly through the dead emptiness of interstellar space. Nor is it any better when mathematical physics reveals to us the world of the infinitely small. In the end we dig up the wisdom of all ages and peoples, only to find that everything most dear and precious to us has already been said in the most superb language. Like greedy children we stretch out our hands and think that, if only we could grasp it, we would possess it too. But what we possess is no longer valid, and our hands grow weary from the grasping, for riches lie everywhere, as far as the eye can reach. All these possessions turn to water, and more than one sorcerer's apprentice has been drowned in the waters called up by himself, if he did not first succumb to the saving delusion that this wisdom was good, and that was bad. It is from these adepts that there come those terrifying invalids who think they have a prophetic mission. 
For the artificial sundering of true and false wisdom creates a tension in the psyche, and from this there arises a loneliness and a craving like that of the morphine addict, who always hopes to find companions in his vice. When our natural inheritance has been dissipated, then the spirit too, as Heraclitus says, has descended from its fiery heights. But when spirit becomes heavy, it turns to water, and with Luciferian presumption, the intellect usurps the seat where once the spirit was enthroned. The spirit may legitimately claim the patria potestas over the soul, not so the earth-born intellect, which is man's sword or hammer, and not a creator of spiritual worlds, a father of the soul. Hence, Ludwig Klages and Max Scheler were moderate enough in their attempts to rehabilitate the spirit, for both were children of an age in which the spirit was no longer up above, but down below, no longer fire, but water. Therefore, the way of the soul in search of its lost father, like Sophia seeking Bythos, leads to the water, to the dark mirror that reposes at its bottom. Whoever has elected for the state of spiritual poverty, the true heritage of Protestantism carried it to its logical conclusion, goes the way of the soul that leads to the water. This water is no figure of speech, but a living symbol of the dark psyche. I can best illustrate this by a concrete example, one out of many. A Protestant theologian often dreamed the same dream. He stood on the mountain slope with a deep valley below, and in it a dark lake. He knew in the dream that something had always prevented him from approaching the lake. This time he resolved to go to the water. As he approached the shore, everything grew dark and uncanny, and a gust of wind suddenly rushed over the face of the water. He was seized by a panic fear and awoke. This dream shows us the natural symbolism. The dreamer descends into his own depths, and the way leads him to the mysterious water. And now there occurs the miracle of the pool of Bethesda. An angel comes down and touches the water, endowing it with healing power. In the dream it is the wind, the pneuma, which bloweth where it listeth. Man's descent to the water is needed in order to evoke the miracle of its coming to life. But the breath of the spirit rushing over the dark water is uncanny, like everything whose cause we do not know, since it is not ourselves. It hints at an unseen presence, a noumen to which neither human expectations nor the machinations of the will have given life. It lives of itself, and the shudder runs through the man who thought that spirit was merely what he believes, what he makes himself, what is said in books or what people talk about. But when it happens spontaneously, it is a spookish thing, and primitive fear seizes the naive mind. The elders of the Algonyi tribe in Kenya gave me exactly the same description of the nocturnal god whom they call the Maker of Fear. He comes to you, they said, like a cold gust of wind, and you shudder, or he goes whistling round in the tall grass. An African pan who glides among the reeds in the haunted noontide hour, playing on his pipes and frightening the shepherds. Thus, in the dream, the breath of the pneuma frightened another pastor, a shepherd of the flock, who, in the darkness of the night, trod the reed-grown shore in the deep valley of the Psyche. Yes, that erstwhile fiery spirit has made a descent to the realm of nature, to the trees and rocks and the waters of the Psyche, like the old man in Nietzsche's Zarathustra, who, wearied of humankind, withdrew into the forest to growl with the bears in honor of the Creator. We must surely go the way of the waters, which always tend downward, if we would raise up the treasure, the precious heritage of the Father. In the Gnostic hymn to the soul, the son is sent forth by his parents to seek the pearl that fell from the king's crown. It lies at the bottom of a deep well, guarded by a dragon, in the land of the Egyptians, 
that land of fleshpots and drunkenness with all its material and spiritual riches. The son and heir sets out to fetch the jewel, but forgets himself and his task in the orgies of Egyptian worldliness until a letter from his father reminds him what his duty is. He then sets out for the water and plunges into the dark depths of the well, where he finds the pearl on the bottom, and in the end offers it to the highest divinity. This hymn, ascribed to Bardasanes, dates from an age that resembled ours in more than one respect. Mankind looked and waited, and it was a fish, Levatus de Profundo, drawn from the deep, that became the symbol of the Saviour, the bringer of healing. As I wrote these lines, I received a letter from Vancouver, from a person unknown to me. The writer is puzzled by his dreams, which are always about water. Almost every time I dream it is about water. Either I am having a bath, or the water closet is overflowing, or a pipe is bursting, or my house has drifted down to the water's edge, or I see an acquaintance about to sink into water, or I am trying to get out of water, or I am having a bath and the tub is about to overflow, etc. Water is the commonest symbol for the unconscious. The lake in the valley is the unconscious, which lies, as it were, underneath consciousness, so that it is often referred to as the subconscious, usually with the pejorative connotation of an inferior consciousness. Water is the valley spirit, the water dragon of Tao, whose nature resembles water, a yang embraced in the yin. Psychologically, therefore, water means spirit that has become unconscious. So the dream of the theologian is quite right in telling him that down by the water he could experience the working of the living spirit like a miracle of healing in the pool of Bethesda. The descent into the depths always seemed to precede the ascent. Thus, another theologian dreamed that he saw on a mountain a kind of castle of the grail. He went along a road that seemed to lead straight to the foot of the mountain and up it. But as he drew nearer, he discovered, to his great disappointment, that a chasm separated him from the mountain, a deep, darksome gorge with underworldly water rushing along the bottom. A steep path led downwards and toilsomely climbed up again on the other side. But the prospect looked uninviting, and the dreamer awoke. Here again the dreamer, thirsting for the shining heights, had first to descend into the dark depths, and this proves to be the indispensable condition for climbing any higher. The prudent man avoids the danger lurking in these depths, but he also throws away the good which a bold but imprudent venture might bring. The statement made by the dream meets with violent resistance from the conscious mind, which knows spirit only as something to be found in the heights. Spirit always seems to come from above, while from below comes everything that is sordid and worthless. For people who think in this way, spirit means highest freedom, a soaring over the depths, deliverance from the prison of the chthonic world, and hence a refuge for all those timorous souls who do not want to become anything different. But water is earthly and tangible. It is also the fluid of the instinct-driven body, blood and the flowing of blood, the odor of the beast, carnality heavy with passion. The unconscious is a psyche that reaches down from the daylight of mentally and morally lucid consciousness into the nervous system that for ages has been known as the sympathetic. This does not govern perception and the muscular activity like the cerebrospinal system and thus control the environment, but, though functioning without sense organs, it maintains the balance of life and, through the mysterious path of sympathetic excitation, not only gives us knowledge of the innermost life of other beings, but also has an inner effect upon them. In this sense, it is an extremely collective system, the operative basis of all participation mystique whereas the cerebrospinal function reaches its high point in separating off the specific qualities of the ego 
and only apprehends surfaces and externals, always through the medium of space. It experiences everything as an outside, whereas the sympathetic system experiences everything as an inside. The unconscious is commonly regarded as a sort of encapsulated fragment of our most personal and intimate life, something like what the Bible calls the heart and considers the source of all evil thoughts. In the chambers of the heart dwell the wicked blood spirits, swift anger and sensual weakness. This is how the unconscious looks when seen from the conscious side. But consciousness appears to be essentially an affair on the cerebrum, which sees everything separately and in isolation, and therefore sees the unconscious in this way too, regarding it outright as my unconscious. Hence, it is generally believed that anyone who descends into the unconscious gets into a suffocating atmosphere of egocentric subjectivity, and in this blind alley is exposed to the attack of all the ferocious beasts which the caverns of the psychic underworld are supposed to harbor. True, whoever looks into the mirror of the water will see first of all his own face. Whoever goes to himself risks a confrontation with himself. The mirror does not flatter, it faithfully shows whatever looks into it, namely, the face we never show to the world because we cover it with the persona, the mask of the actor. But the mirror lies behind the mask and shows the true face. This confrontation is the first test of courage on the inner way, a test sufficient to frighten off most people for the meeting with ourselves belongs to the more unpleasant things that can be avoided so long as we can project everything negative into the environment. But if we are able to see our own shadow and can bear knowing about it, then a small part of the problem has already been solved. We have at least brought up the personal unconscious. The shadow was a living part of the personality and therefore wants to live with it in some form. It cannot be argued out of existence or rationalized into harmlessness. This problem is exceedingly difficult because it not only challenges the whole man but reminds him at the same time of his helplessness and ineffectuality. Strong natures, or should one rather call them weak, do not like to be reminded of this but prefer to think of themselves as heroes who are beyond good and evil and to cut the Gordian knot instead of untying it. Nevertheless, the account has to be settled sooner or later. In the end, one has to admit that there are problems which one simply cannot solve on one's own resources. Such an admission has the advantage of being honest, truthful and in accord with reality, and this prepares the ground for a compensatory reaction from the collective unconscious. You are now more inclined to give heed to a helpful idea or intuition, or to notice thoughts which had not been allowed to voice themselves before. Perhaps you will pay attention to the dreams that visit you at such moments, or will reflect on certain inner and outer occurrences that take place just at this time. If you have an attitude of this kind, then the helpful powers slumbering in the deeper strata of man's nature can come awake and intervene, for helplessness and weakness are the eternal experience and the eternal problems of mankind. To this problem there is also an eternal answer, otherwise it would have been all up with humanity long ago. When you have done everything that could possibly be done, the only thing that remains is what you could still do if only you knew it. But how much do we know of ourselves? Precious little to judge by experience. Hence, there is still a great deal of room left for the unconscious. Prayer, as we know, calls for a very similar attitude and therefore has much the same effect. The necessary and needful reaction from the collective unconscious expresses itself in archetypally formed ideas. The meeting with oneself is, at first, the meeting with one's own shadow. The shadow is a tight passage, a narrow door, whose painful constriction no one is spared who goes down to the deep well. But one must learn to know oneself in order to know who one is. 
For what comes after the door is, surprisingly enough, a boundless expanse full of unprecedented uncertainty, with apparently no inside and no outside, no above and no below, no here and no there, no mine and no thine, no good and no bad. It is the world of water where all life floats in suspension, where the realm of the sympathetic system the soul of everything living, beings, where I am indivisibly this and that, where I experience the other in myself and the other than myself experiences me. No, the collective unconscious is anything but an encapsulated personal system. It is sheer objectivity, as wide as the world and open to all the world. There, I am the object of every subject, in complete reversal of my ordinary consciousness, where I am always the subject that has an object. There, I am utterly one with the world, so much a part of it that I forget all too easily who I really am. Lost in oneself is a good way of describing this state. But this self is the world, if only a consciousness could see it. That is why we must know who we are. The unconscious no sooner touches us than we are it. We become unconscious of ourselves. That is the age-old danger, instinctively known and feared by primitive man, who himself stands so very close to this pleroma. His consciousness is still uncertain, wobbling on its feet. It is still childish, having just emerged from the primal waters. A wave of the unconscious may easily roll over it, and then he forgets who he was, and does things that are strange to him. Hence, primitives are afraid of uncontrolled emotions, because consciousness breaks down under them and gives way to possession. All man's strivings have therefore been directed towards the consolidation of consciousness. This was the purpose of right and dogma. They were dams and walls to keep back the dangers of the unconscious, the perils of the soul. Primitive rites consist accordingly in the exercising of spirits, the lifting of spells, the averting of the evil omen, propitiation, purification, and the production by sympathetic magic of helpful occurrences. It is these barriers, erected in primitive times, that later become the foundations of the Church. It is also these barriers that collapse when the symbols become weak with age. Then the waters rise and the boundless catastrophes break over mankind. The religious leader of the Taos Pueblo, known as the Loco Tenente Gobernador, once said to me, The Americans should stop meddling with our religion, for when it dies and we can no longer help the Son, our Father, to cross the sky, the Americans and the whole world will learn something in ten years' time, for then the Son won't rise anymore. In other words, night will fall, the light of consciousness is extinguished, and the dark sea of the unconscious breaks in. Whether primitive or not, Mankind always stands on the brink of actions it performs itself but does not control. The whole world wants peace and the whole world prepares for war to take but one example. Mankind is powerless against mankind and the gods, as ever, show it the ways of fate. Today we call the gods factors, which comes from facere, to make. The makers stand behind the wings of the world theatre. It is so in great things as in small. In the realm of consciousness we are our own masters, we seem to be the factors themselves. But if we step through the door of the shadow, we discover with terror that we are the objects of unseen factors. To know this is decidedly unpleasant, for nothing is more disillusioning than the discovery of our own inadequacy. It can even give rise to primitive panic, because instead of being believed in, the anxiously guarded supremacy of consciousness, which is in truth one of the secrets of human success, is questioned in the most dangerous way. 
But since ignorance is no guarantee of security, and in fact only makes our insecurity still worse, it is probably better, despite our fear, to know where the danger lies. To ask the right question is already half the solution of a problem. At any rate, we then know that the greatest danger threatening us comes from the unpredictability of the psyche's reactions. Discerning persons have realized for some time that external historical conditions, of whatever kind, are only occasions jumping off grounds for the real dangers that threaten our lives. These are the present politico-social delusional systems. We should not regard them causally as necessary consequences of external conditions, but as decisions precipitated by the collective unconscious. This is a new problem. All ages before us have believed in gods in some form or other. Only an unparalleled impoverishment of symbolism could enable us to rediscover the gods as psychic factors, that is, as archetypes of the unconscious. No doubt, this discovery is hardly credible at present. To be convinced, we need to have the experience pictured in the dream of the theologian, for only then do we experience the self-activity of the spirit moving over the waters. Since the stars have fallen from heaven, and our highest symbols have paled, a secret life holds sway in the unconscious. That is why we have a psychology today and why we speak of the unconscious. All this would be quite superfluous in an age or culture that possessed symbols. Symbols are spirit from above, and under those conditions the spirit is above too. Therefore, it would be a foolish and senseless undertaking for such people to wish to experience or investigate an unconscious that contains nothing but the silent, undisturbed sway of nature. Our unconscious, on the other hand, hides living water, spirit that has become nature, and that is why it is disturbed. Heaven has become for us the cosmic space of the physicists, and the divine Empyrean a fair memory of things that once were. But the heart glows, and the secret unrest gnaws at the roots of our being. In the words of the Voluspa, we may ask, What murmurs Votan over Mimir's head? Already the spring boils. Our concern with the unconscious has become a vital question for us a question of spiritual being or non-being. All those who have had an experience like that mentioned in the dream know that the treasure lies in the depths of the water and will try to salvage it. As they must never forget who they are, they must on no account imperil their consciousness. They will keep their standpoint firmly anchored to the earth and will thus, to preserve the metaphor, become fishes who catch with hooks and net what swims in the water. There may be consummate fools who do not understand what fishermen do, but the latter will not mistake the timeless meaning of their action, for the symbol of their craft is many centuries older than the still unfaded story of the grail. But not every man is a fisherman. Sometimes this figure remains arrested at an early, instinctive level, and then it is an otter, as we know from Oscar Schmitz's fairy tales. Whoever looks into the water sees his own image, but behind it living creatures soon loom up, fishes presumably harmless dwellers of the deep, harmless if only the lake were not haunted. They are water beings of a peculiar sort. Sometimes a nixie gets into the fisherman's net, a female, half-human fish. Nixies are entrancing creatures, as this little poem shows. Half drew she him, half sank he down, and never more was seen. The Nixie is an even more instinctive version of a magical feminine being whom I call the Anima. She can also be a siren, Melusina, a mermaid, wood nymph, Grace, or Erlking's daughter, or a Lamia, or Succubus, who infatuates young men and sucks the life out of them. 
Moralizing critics will say that these figures are projections of soulful emotional states and are nothing but worthless fantasies. One must admit that there is a certain amount of truth in this. But is it the whole truth? Is the Nixie really nothing but a product of moral laxity? Were there not such beings long ago, in an age when dawning human consciousness was still wholly bound to nature? Surely there were spirits of forests, fields, and streams long before the question of moral conscience ever existed. What is more, these beings were as much dreaded as adored, so that their rather peculiar erotic charms were only one of their characteristics. Man's consciousness was then far simpler, and his possession of it absurdly small. An unlimited amount of what we now feel to be an integral part of our psychic being disports itself merrily for the primitive in projections ranging far and wide. The word projection is not really appropriate, for nothing has been cast out of the psyche. Rather, the psyche has attained its present complexity by a series of acts of interjection. Its complexity has increased in proportion to the despiritualization of nature. An alluring Nixie from the dim bygone is today called an erotic fantasy, and she may complicate our psychic life in a most painful way. She comes upon us just as a Nixie might. She sits on top of us like a succubus. She changes into all sorts of shapes like a witch, and in general displays an unbearable independence that does not seem at all proper in a psychic content. Occasionally, she causes states of fascination that rival the best bewitchment, or unleashes terrors in us not to be outdone by any manifestation of the devil. She is a mischievous being who crosses our path in numerous transformations and disguises, playing all kinds of tricks on us, causing happy and unhappy delusions, depressions and ecstasies, outbursts of effect, etc. Even in a state of reasonable interjection, the Nixie has not laid aside her roguery. The witch has not ceased to mix her vile potions of love and death. Her magic poison has been refined into intrigue and self-deception, unseen though nonetheless dangerous for that. But how do we dare to call this elfin being the anima? Anima means soul and should designate something very wonderful and immortal. Yet this was not always so. We should not forget that this kind of soul is a dogmatic conception whose purpose it is to pin down and capture something uncannily alive and active. The German word Seele is closely related via the Gothic form Saiwalo to the Greek word Aeolos, which means quick-moving, changeful of hue, twinkling, something like a butterfly which reels drunkenly from flower to flower and lives on honey and love. In a Gnostic typology, the psychic man is inferior to the spiritual man, and finally, there are wicked souls who must roast in hell for all eternity. Even the quite innocent soul of the unbaptized newborn babe is deprived of the contemplation of God. Among primitives, The soul is the magic breath of life, hence the term anima, or a flame. An uncanonical saying of our Lord's aptly declares, Whoso is near unto me is near to the fire. For Heraclitus, the soul at the highest level is fiery and dry. Being that a soul is living being. Soul is the living thing in man that which lives of itself and causes life. Therefore God breathed into Adam a living breath that he might live. With her cunning play of illusions, the soul lures into life the inertness of matter that does not want to live. She makes us believe incredible things, that life may be lived. She is full of snares and traps in order that man should fall, should reach the earth, entangle himself there and stay caught so that life should be lived as even the garden of eden could not rest content until she had convinced adam of the goodness of the forbidden apple 
Were it not for the leaping and twinkling of the soul, man would rot away in his greatest passion, idleness. A certain kind of reasonableness is its advocate, and a certain kind of morality adds its blessing. But to have soul is the whole adventure of life, for soul is a life-giving demon who plays his elfin game above and below human existence. He is threatened and propitiated with superhuman punishments and blessings that go far beyond the possible deserts of human beings. Heaven and hell are the fates meted out to the soul and not to civilized man, who, in his nakedness and timidity, would have no idea of what to do with himself in the heavenly Jerusalem. The anima is not the soul in the dogmatic sense, not an anima rationalis, which is a philosophical conception, but a natural archetype that satisfactorily sums up all the statements of the unconscious, of the primitive mind, of the history of language and religion. It is a factor in the proper sense of the word, Man cannot make it. On the contrary, it is always an a priori element in his mood. Reactions, impulses, and whatever else is spontaneous in psychic life. It is something that lives of itself, that makes us live. It is a life behind consciousness that cannot be completely integrated with it, but from which, on the contrary, consciousness arises. For, in the last analysis, Psychic life is for the greater part an unconscious life that surrounds consciousness on all sides. A notion that is sufficiently obvious when one considers how much unconscious preparation is needed, for instance, to register a sense impression. Although it seems as if the whole of our unconscious psychic life could be ascribed to the anima, she is yet only one archetype among many. Therefore, she is not characteristic of the unconscious in its entirety. She is only one of its aspects. This is shown by the very fact of her femininity. What is not I, not masculine, is most probably feminine. And because the not I is felt as not belonging to me, and therefore as outside me, the anima image is usually projected upon women. Either sex is inhabited by the opposite sex up to a point, for, biologically speaking, it is simply the greater number of masculine genes that tips the scales in favor of masculinity. The smaller number of feminine genes seems to form a feminine character, which usually remains unconscious because of its subordinate position. With the archetype of the anima, we enter the realm of the gods, or rather, the realm that metaphysics has reserved for itself. Everything the anima touches becomes numinous, unconditional, dangerous, taboo, and magical. She is the serpent in the paradise of the harmless man with good resolutions and still better intentions. She affords the most convincing reasons for not prying into the unconscious, an occupation that would break down our moral inhibitions and unleash forces that had better been left unconscious and undisturbed. As usual, there is something in what the anima says, for life in itself is not good only, it is also bad. Because the anima wants life, she wants both good and bad. These categories do not exist in the elfin realm. Bodily life, as well as psychic life, have the impudence to get along much better without conventional morality, and they often remain the healthier for it. The anima believes in the Greek idea of the beautiful and the good, a primitive conception that antedates the discovery of the conflict between aesthetics and morals. It took more than a thousand years of Christian differentiation to make it clear that the good is not always the beautiful, and the beautiful not necessarily good. The paradox of this marriage of ideas troubled the ancients as little as it does the primitives. The anima is conservative and clings in the most exasperating fashion to the ways of earlier humanity. She likes to appear in historic dress, with a predilection for Greece and Egypt. In this connection, we would mention the classic anima stories of Ryder Haggard and Pierre Benoit. 
The Renaissance dream, known as the Ipnerotomachia of Polyphilo and Goethe's Faust, likewise reached deep into antiquity in order to find le vraiment for the situation. Polyphilo conjured up Queen Venus, Goethe, Helen of Troy. Aniele Jaffe has sketched a lively picture of the anima in the age of Biedermeier and the Romantics. If you want to know what happens when the anima appears in modern society, I can warmly recommend John Erskine's Private Life of Helen of Troy. She is not a shallow creation, for the breath of eternity lies over everything that is really alive. The anima lives beyond all categories and can therefore dispense with blame as well as with praise. Since the beginning of time, man, with his wholesome animal instinct, has been engaged in combat with his soul and its demonism. If the soul were uniformly dark, it would be a simple matter. Unfortunately, this is not so, for the anima can appear also as an angel of light, a psychopomp who points the way into the highest meaning, as we know from Faust. If the encounter with the shadow is the apprentice piece to the individual's development, then that with the anima is the masterpiece. The relation with the anima is again a test of courage, an ordeal by fire for the spiritual and moral forces of man. We should never forget that in dealing with the anima, we are dealing with psychic facts which have never been in man's possession before since they were always found outside his psychic territory, so to speak, in the form of projections. For the son, the anima is hidden in the dominating power of the mother, and sometimes she leaves him with a sentimental attachment that lasts throughout life and seriously impairs the fate of the adult. On the other hand, she may spur him on to the greatest flights. To the man of antiquity, the anima appeared as a goddess or a witch, while for medieval man the goddess was replaced by the queen of heaven and mother church. The desymbolized world of the protestant produced first an unhealthy sentimentality and then a sharpening of the moral conflict, which, because it was so unbearable, led logically to Nietzsche's beyond good and evil. In centers of civilization, this state shows itself in the increasing insecurity of marriage. The American divorce rate has been reached, if not exceeded, in many European countries, which proves that the anima projects herself by preference on the opposite sex, thus giving rise to magically complicated relationships. This fact, largely because of its pathological consequences, has led to the growth of modern psychology, which in its Freudian form cherishes the belief that the essential cause of all disturbances is sexuality, a view that only exacerbates the already existing conflict. There is a confusion here between cause and effect. The sexual disturbance is by no means the cause of neurotic difficulties, but is, like these, one of the pathological effects of a maladaptation of consciousness, and when consciousness is faced with situations and tasks to which it is not equal. Such a person simply does not understand how the world has altered, and what his attitude would have to be in order to adapt to it. In dealing with the shadow or anima, it is not sufficient just to know about these concepts and to reflect on them. Nor can we ever experience their content by feeling our way into them or by appropriating other people's feelings. It is no use at all to learn a list of archetypes by heart. Archetypes are complexes of experience that come upon us like fate and their effects are felt in our most personal life. The anima no longer crosses our path as a goddess, but it may be as an intimately personal misadventure, or perhaps as our best venture. When, for instance, a highly esteemed professor in his seventies abandons his family and runs off with a young red-headed actress, we know that the gods have claimed another victim. This is how demonic power reveals itself to us. 
Until not so long ago, it would have been an easy matter to do away with the young woman as a witch. In my experience, there are very many people of intelligence and education who have no trouble grasping the idea of the anima and her relative autonomy and can also understand the phenomenology of the animus in women. Psychologists have more difficulties to overcome in this respect, probably because they are under no compulsion to grapple with the complex facts peculiar to the psychology of the unconscious. If they are doctors as well, their somatopsychological thinking gets in the way, with its assumption that psychological processes can be expressed in intellectual, biological, or physiological terms. Psychology, however, is neither biology, nor physiology, nor any other science than just this knowledge of the psyche. The picture I have drawn of the anima so far is not complete. Although she may be the chaotic urge to life, something strangely meaningful clings to her, a secret knowledge or hidden wisdom which contrasts more curiously with her irrational elfin nature. Here I would like to refer again to the authors already cited. Ryder Haggard calls she Wisdom's Daughter. Benoaz, Queen of Atlantis, has an excellent library that even contains a lost book of Plato. Helen of Troy, in her reincarnation, is rescued from a Tyrian brothel by the wise Simon Magus and accompanies him on his travels. I purposely refrained from mentioning this thoroughly characteristic aspect of the anima earlier, because the first encounter with her usually leads one to infer anything rather than wisdom. This aspect appears only to the person who gets to grips with her seriously. Only then, when this hard task has been faced, does he come to realize more and more that behind all her cruel sporting with human fate, there lies something like a hidden purpose which seems to reflect a superior knowledge of life's laws. It is just the most unexpected, the most terrifyingly chaotic things which reveal a deeper meaning. And the more this meaning is recognized, the more the anima loses her impetus and compulsive character. Gradually, breakwaters are built against a surging of chaos, and the meaningful divides itself from the meaningless. When sense and nonsense are no longer identical, the force of chaos is weakened by their subtraction. Sense is then endued with the force of meaning, and nonsense with the force of meaninglessness. In this way, a new cosmos arises. This is not a new discovery in the realm of medical psychology, but the age-old truth that out of the richness of a man's experience there comes a teaching which the father can pass on to the son. In elfin nature, wisdom and folly appear as one and the same, and they are one and the same as long as they are acted out by the anima. Life is crazy and meaningful at once, and when we do not laugh over the one aspect and speculate about the other, life is exceedingly drab, and everything is reduced to the littlest scale. There is then little sense and little nonsense either. When you come to think about it, nothing has any meaning, and when there was nobody to think, there was nobody to interpret what happened. Interpretations are only for those who don't understand. It is only the things we don't understand that have any meaning. Man woke up in a world he did not understand, and that is why he tries to interpret it. Thus, the anima and life itself are meaningless in so far as they offer no interpretation. Yet they have a nature that can be interpreted. For in all chaos there is a cosmos, in all disorder, a secret order, in all caprice, a fixed law, for everything that works is grounded on its opposite. It takes man's discriminating understanding, which breaks everything down into antinomial judgments, to recognize this. Once he comes to grips with the anima, her chaotic capriciousness will give him cause to suspect a secret order, to sense a plan, a meaning, a purpose over and above her nature, or even, we might almost be tempted to say, 
to postulate such a thing, that this would not be in accord with the truth. For in actual reality we do not have at our command any power of cool reflection, nor does any science or philosophy help us, and the traditional teachings of religion do so only to a limited degree. We are caught and entangled in aimless experience, and the judging intellect with its categories proves itself powerless. Human interpretation fails, for a turbulent life situation has arisen that refuses to fit any of the traditional meanings assigned to it. It is a moment of collapse. We sink into a final depth. Apuleius calls it a kind of voluntary death. It is a surrender of our own powers, not artificially willed, but forced upon us by nature. Not a voluntary submission and humiliation decked in moral garb, but an utter and unmistakable defeat crowned with the panic fear of demoralization. Only when all props and crutches are broken, and no cover from the rear offers even the slightest hope of security, does it become possible for us to experience an archetype that up till then had laid hidden behind the meaningful nonsense played out by the anima. This is the archetype of meaning, just as the anima is the archetype of life itself. It always seems to us as if meaning, compared with life, were the younger event, because we assume, with some justification, that we assign it of ourselves, and because we believe, equally rightly no doubt, that the great world can get along without being interpreted. But how do we assign meaning? From what source in the last analysis do we derive meaning? The form we use for assigning meaning are historical categories that reach back into the mists of time, a fact we do not take sufficiently into account. Interpretations make use of certain linguistic matrices that are themselves derived from primordial images. From whatever side we approach this question, everywhere we find ourselves confronted with the history of language, with images and motifs that lead straight back to the primitive wonder world. Take, for instance, the word idea. It goes back to the Eidos concept of Plato and the eternal ideas are primordial images stored up in a supercelestial place as eternal, transcendent forms. The eye of the seer perceives them as imagines et lares, or as images in dreams and revelatory visions. Or let us take the concept of energy, which is an interpretation of physical events. In earlier times, it was the secret fire of the alchemists, or phlogiston, or the heat force inherent in matter, like the primal warmth of the Stoics, or the Heracletian ever-living fire, which borders on the primitive notion of an all-pervading vital force, a power of growth and magic healing that is generally called mana. I will not go on needlessly giving examples. It is sufficient to know that there is not a single important idea or view that does not possess historical antecedents. Ultimately, they are all founded on primordial archetypal forms, whose concreteness dates from a time when consciousness did not think, but only perceived. Thoughts were objects of inner perception, not thought at all, but sensed as external phenomena, seen or heard, so to speak. Thought was essentially revelation, not invented, but forced upon us, or bringing conviction through its immediacy and actuality. Thinking of this kind precedes the primitive ego consciousness, and the latter is more its object than its subject. But we ourselves have not yet climbed the last peak of consciousness. So we also have a pre-existent thinking, of which we are not aware so long as we are supported by traditional symbols, or, to put it in the language of dreams, so long as the father or the king is not dead. I would like to give you an example of how the unconscious thinks and paves the way for solutions. It is the case of a young theological student whom I did not know personally. He was in great straits because of his religious beliefs, and about this time he dreamed the following dream. 
he was standing in the presence of a handsome old man dressed entirely in black. He knew it was the white magician. This personage had just addressed him at considerable length, but the dreamer could no longer remember what it was about. He had only retained the closing words. And for this we need the help of the black magician. At that moment the door opened, and in came another old man exactly like the first, except that he was dressed in white. He said to the white magician, I need your advice, but threw a sidelong, questioning look at the dreamer, whereupon the white magician answered, You can speak freely, he is an innocent. The black magician then began to relate his story. He had come from a distant land where something extraordinary had happened. The country was ruled by an old king who felt his death near. He, the king, had sought out a tomb for himself. For there were in that land a great number of tombs from ancient times, and the king had chosen the finest for himself. According to legend, a virgin had been buried in it. The king caused the tomb to be opened in order to get it ready for use. But when the bones it contained were exposed to the light of day, they suddenly took on life and changed into a black horse, which at once fled into the desert and there vanished. The black magician had heard of this story and immediately set forth in pursuit of the horse. After a journey of many days, always on the tracks of the horse, he came to the desert and crossed to the other side, where the grasslands began again. There he met the horse grazing and there also he came upon the find on whose account he now needed the advice of the white magician. For he had found the lost keys of paradise, and he did not know what to do with them. At this exciting moment the dreamer awoke. In the light of our earlier remarks, the meaning of the dream is not hard to guess. The old king is the ruling symbol that wants to go to its eternal rest, and in the very place where similar dominance lie buried. His choice falls, fittingly enough, on the grave of Anima, who lies in the death trance of a sleeping beauty, so long as the king is alive, that is, so long as a valid principle, a prince or princeps, regulates and expresses life. But when the king draws to his end, she comes to life again, and changes into a black horse which in Plato's parable stands for the unruliness of the passions. Anyone who follows this horse comes into a desert, into a wild land remote from men, an image of spiritual and moral isolation. But there lie the keys of paradise. Now what is paradise? Clearly, the Garden of Eden with its two-faced tree of life and knowledge and its four streams. In the Christian version, it is also the heavenly city of the Apocalypse, which, like the Garden of Eden, is conceived as a mandala. But the mandala is a symbol of individuation, so it is the black magician who finds the keys to the solution of the problems of belief weighing on the dreamer, the keys that open the way of individuation. The contrast between desert and paradise therefore signifies isolation as contrasted with individuation, or the becoming of the self. This part of the dream is a remarkable paraphrase of the Oxyrhynchus sayings of Jesus, in which the way of the kingdom of heaven is pointed out by animals, and where we find the admonition, Therefore know yourselves, for you are the city, and the city is the kingdom. It is also a paraphrase of the serpent of paradise who persuaded our first parents to sin, and who finally leads to the redemption of mankind through the Son of God. As we know, this causal nexus gave rise to the ophitic identification of the serpent with the Saviour. The black horse and the black magician are half-evil elements, whose relativity with respect to good is hinted at in the exchange of garments. The two magicians are, indeed, two aspects of the wise old man, the superior master and teacher, the archetype of the spirit, who symbolizes the pre-existent meaning hidden in the chaos of life. He is the father of the soul, and yet the soul in some miraculous manner is also his virgin mother, 
for which reason he was called by the alchemists the first son of the mother. The black magician and the black horse correspond to the descent into darkness in the dreams mentioned earlier. What an unbearably hard lesson for a young student of theology. Fortunately, he was not in the least aware that the father of all prophets had spoken to him in the dream and placed a great secret almost within his grasp. One marvels at the inappropriateness of such occurrences. Why this prodigality? But I have to admit that we do not know how this dream affected the student in the long run, and I must emphasize that to me at least the dream had a very great deal to say. It was not allowed to get lost, even though the dreamer did not understand it. The old man in this dream is obviously trying to show how good and evil function together, presumably as an answer to the still unresolved moral conflict in the Christian psyche. With this peculiar relativization of opposites, we find ourselves approaching nearer to the ideas of the East, to the nirdwandwa of Hindu philosophy, the freedom from opposites, which is shown as a possible way of solving the conflict through reconciliation. How perilously fraught with meaning this Eastern relativity of good and evil is, can be seen from the Indian aphoristic question, who takes longer to reach perfection? The man who loves God or the man who hates him? And the answer is, he who loves God takes seven reincarnations to reach perfection, and he who hates God takes only three, for he who hates God will think of him more than he who loves him. Freedom from opposites presupposes their functional equivalence, and this offends our Christian feelings. Nonetheless, as our dream example shows, The balanced cooperation of moral opposites is a natural truth which has been recognized just as naturally by the East. The clearest example of this is to be found in Taoist philosophy. But in the Christian tradition too, there are various sayings that come very close to this standpoint. I need only remind you of the parable of the unjust steward. Our dream is by no means unique in this respect. For the tendency to relativize opposites is a notable peculiarity of the unconscious. One must immediately add, however, that this is true only in cases of exaggerated moral sensibility. In other cases, the unconscious can insist just as inexorably on the irreconcilability of the opposites. As a rule, the standpoint of the unconscious is relative to the conscious attitude. We can probably say, therefore, that our dream presupposes the specific beliefs and doubts of a theological consciousness of Protestant persuasion. This limits the statement of the dream to a definite set of problems. But even with this paring down of its validity, the dream clearly demonstrates the superiority of its standpoint. Fittingly enough, it expresses its meaning in the opinion and voice of a wise magician who goes back in direct line to the figure of the medicine man in primitive society. He is, like the anima, an immortal demon that pierces the chaotic darkness of brute life with the light of meaning. He is the enlightener, the master and teacher, a psychopomp whose personification even Nietzsche, that breaker of tablets, could not escape, for he had called up his reincarnation in Zarathustra, the lofty spirit of an almost Homeric age, as the carrier and mouthpiece of his own Dionysian enlightenment and ecstasy. For him, God was dead, but the driving demon of wisdom became, as it were, his bodily double. He himself says, Then one was changed to two, and Zarathustra passed me by. Zarathustra is more for Nietzsche than a poetic figure. He is an involuntary confession, a testament. Nietzsche too had lost his way in the darkness of a life that turned its back upon God and Christianity, and that is why there came to him the revealer and enlightener, the speaking fountainhead of his soul. Here is the source of the hieratic language of Zarathustra, for that is the style of this archetype. 
modern man in experiencing this archetype comes to know that most ancient forms of thinking is an autonomous activity whose object he is. Hermes Trismegistus, or the Thoth of Hermetic literature, Orpheus, the Poimandres, that's the shepherd of men, and his near relation, the Poiman of Hermes, are other formulations of the same experience. If the name Lucifer were not prejudicial, it would be a very suitable one for this archetype. But I have been content to call it the archetype of the wise old man or of meaning. Like all archetypes, it has a positive and a negative aspect, though I don't want to enter into this here. The reader will find a detailed exposition of the two-facedness of the wise old man in The Phenomenology of the Spirit in Fairy Tales. The three archetypes so far discussed, the shadow, the anima, and the wise old man, are of a kind that can be directly experienced in personified form. In the foregoing, I try to indicate the general psychological conditions in which such an experience arises. But what I conveyed were only abstract generalizations. One could, or rather should, really give a description of the process as it occurs in immediate experience. In the course of this process, the archetypes appear as active personalities in dreams and fantasies. But the process itself involves another class of archetype which one could call the archetypes of transformation. They are not personalities, but are typical situations, places, ways and means that symbolize the kind of transformation in question. Like the personalities, these archetypes are true and genuine symbols that cannot be exhaustively interpreted either as signs or as allegories. They are genuine symbols precisely because they are ambiguous, full of half-glimpsed meanings, and in the last resort inexhaustible. The ground principles, the archai, of the unconscious are indescribable because of their wealth of reference, although in themselves recognizable. The discriminating intellect naturally keeps on trying to establish their singleness of meaning and thus misses the essential point. For what we can above all establish as the one thing consistent with their nature is their manifold meaning, their almost limitless wealth of reference which makes any unilateral formulation impossible. Besides this, they are in principle paradoxical. Just as for the alchemists, the spirit was conceived as Xenax et juvenis simul, an old man and the youth at once. If one wants to form a picture of the symbolic process, the series of pictures found in alchemy are good examples, though the symbols they contain are for the most part traditional despite their often obscure origin and significance. An excellent Eastern example is the Tantric Chakra System, or the mystical nerve system of Chinese yoga. It also seems as if the set of pictures in the tarot cards were distantly descended from the archetypes of transformation, a view that has been confirmed for me in a very enlightening lecture by Professor Bernoulli. The symbolic process is an experience in images and of images. Its development usually shows an enantiodromian structure like the text of the I Ching and so presents a rhythm of negative and positive, loss and gain, dark and light. Its beginning is almost invariably characterized by one's getting stuck in a blind alley or in some impossible situation, and its goal is, broadly speaking, illumination or higher consciousness, by means of which the initial situation is overcome on a higher level. As regards the time factor, the process may be compressed into a single dream or into short moment of experience, or it may extend over months and years, depending on the nature of the initial situation, the person involved in the process and the goal to be reached. The wealth of symbols naturally varies enormously from case to case. Although everything is experienced in image form, i.e. symbolically, it is by no means a question of fictitious dangers, but of very real risks upon which the fate of a whole life may depend. The chief danger is that of succumbing to the fascinating influence of the archetypes, and this is most likely to happen when the archetypal images are not made conscious. 
If there is already a predisposition to psychosis, it may even happen that the archetypal figures, which are endowed with a certain autonomy anyway, on account of their natural luminosity, will escape from conscious control altogether and become completely independent, thus producing the phenomena of possession. In the case of an anima possession, for instance, the patient will want to change himself into a woman through self-castration, or he is afraid that something of the sort will be done to him by force. The best-known example of this is Schreber's Memoirs of My Nervous Illness. Patients often discover a whole anima mythology with numerous archaic motives. A case of this kind was published some time ago by Nelkin. Another patient has described his experiences himself and commented on them in a book. I mention these examples because there are still people who think that the archetypes are subjective chimeras of my own brain. The things that come to light brutally in insanity remain hidden in the background in neurosis, but they continue to influence consciousness nonetheless. When therefore the analysis penetrates the background of conscious phenomena, it discovers the same archetypal figures that activate the deliriums of psychotics. Finally, there is any amount of literary and historical evidence to prove that in the case of these archetypes, we are dealing with normal types of fantasy that occur practically everywhere and not with the monstrous products of insanity. The pathological element does not lie in the existence of these ideas, but in the dissociation of consciousness that can no longer control the unconscious. In all cases of dissociation, it is therefore necessary to integrate the unconscious into consciousness. This is a synthetic process, which I have termed the individuation process. As a matter of fact, this process follows the natural course of life, a life in which the individual becomes what he always was. Because man has consciousness, a development of this kind does not run very smoothly. Often it is varied and disturbed because consciousness deviates again and again from its archetypal, instinctual foundation and finds itself in opposition to it. There then arises the need for a synthesis of the two positions. This amounts to psychotherapy even on the primitive level, where it takes the form of restitution ceremonies. As examples, I would mention the identification of the Australian Aborigines with their ancestors in the Alcaringa period, identification with the Sons of the Sun among the Pueblos of Taos, the Helios Apotheosis in the Isis Mysteries, and so on. Accordingly, the therapeutic method of complex psychology consists on the one hand in making as fully conscious as possible the constellated unconscious contents, and on the other hand in synthesizing them with consciousness through the act of recognition. Since, however, civilized man possesses a high degree of this sociability and makes continual use of it in order to avoid every possible risk, it is by no means a foregone conclusion that recognition will be followed by the appropriate action. On the contrary, we have to reckon with the singular ineffectiveness of recognition and must therefore insist on a meaningful application of it. Recognition by itself does not as a rule do this, nor does it imply as such any moral strength. In these cases, it becomes very clear how much the cure of neurosis is a moral problem. As the archetypes, like all numinous contents, are relatively autonomous, they cannot be integrated simply by rational means, but require a dialectical procedure, a real coming to terms with them, often conducted by the patient in dialogue form, so that, without knowing it, he puts into effect the alchemical definition of the meditatio, an inner colloquy with one's good angel. Usually, the process runs a dramatic course, with many ups and downs. It expresses itself in or is accompanied by dream symbols that are related to the representations collectives, which in the form of mythological motives have portrayed psychic processes of transformation since the earliest times. In the short space of a lecture, I must content myself with giving only a few examples of archetypes. I have chosen the ones that play the chief part in an analysis of the masculine psyche, 
and have tried to give you some idea of the transformation process in which they appear. Since this lecture was first published, the figures of the shadow, anima and wise old man together with the corresponding figures of the feminine unconscious have been dealt with in greater detail in my contributions to the symbolism of the self and the individuation process in its relation to alchemical symbolism has also been subjected to closer investigation.